Sitting proudly on her glass sea, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's SS Great Britain dominates Bristol's historic waterfront. She was built to serve the growing transatlantic passenger trade between England and the United States. The ship was unique at the time in terms of its construction and size. She was the first propeller-driven, ocean-going, wrought iron ship in the world, also coming in 100 feet longer than any of her rivals. The dock in which she sits today is the very dry dock constructed by Brunel and the Great Western Steamship Company in which the great ship was built and then launched in 1843 by Prince Albert. When launched, she had been designed as an ocean liner. The SS Great Britain was a ship for the wealthy, with early fares of between 20 and 28 guineas, equivalent to £3,000 today. The ship was renowned for its opulent interiors, with artwork, gold leaf decorations and mod cons, which were unrivaled by other ships of her day. When fitting out was completed in 1845, she was 322 feet in length, 50 and a half feet wide, and displaced 3,400 tons. 100 tons larger than anything else afloat. There was a crew of 130 and she could accommodate 360 paying passengers. She originally carried six fully rigged masts, allowing thousands of feet of sails to augment her engine power. During her life, her role and appearance drastically changed at least three times. By the early 1850s, her masts had been reduced to four. She had new engines and boilers, a new three-bladed propeller, and her passenger accommodation had been increased to 730. She also had new owners who intended to employ Great Britain to exploit a temporary demand for passenger services to the Australian gold fields, following the discovery of gold in Australia in 1851. She continued on this run for 30 years, completing 32 voyages, carrying 16,000 emigrants to Australia. By the late 1870s, the Great Britain was showing her age. Her engines were removed and she was again converted, this time into a fast, three-masted sailing ship. In this unrecognisable guise, the once proud ship transported Welsh coal to San Francisco. On her third trip, however, she ran into trouble around Cape Horn and was forced to run for the shelter of Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands. Damaged as a result of this, she was sold as a coal and wool storage hulk in Port Stanley. By 1937, the Great Britain's hull was no longer watertight and after being towed a short distance from Port Stanley, she was beached and abandoned to the elements. Attempts to rescue her in the late 1930s and 1960s failed. But finally, in 1970, an epic salvage effort refloated the ship and she was towed back home across the Atlantic to Bristol. Despite spending nearly 100 years suffering in the harsh South Atlantic weather, the Great Britain was able to float up the River Avon herself. By 1998, an extensive survey discovered that the hull was continuing to corrode in the humid atmosphere of the dock, and estimates gave her 20 years 
before she completely corroded away. Extensive conservation work began, which culminated in the installation of a glass plate across the dry dock at the level of her waterline. With two dehumidifiers keeping the space beneath at 22% relative humidity. Sufficiently dry to preserve the surviving material of the hull. Stepping below the waterline today, visitors can see the sorry state her plates are in. With many of the tens of thousands of rivets holding her together now missing and plates buckling. This view from beneath gives a fascinating insight into how the ship and dock was constructed. At the stern sits a replica of the original six-bladed propeller. This was found to be wholly inefficient and was later replaced with a four-bladed and then a three-blade version. The dockyard today portrays a scene reminiscent of a voyage departure day with the keys crammed with passengers luggage, stores, livestock for the journey as well as tons of cargo including barrels of one of Bristol's most famous exports, sherry. On boarding, I was immediately struck by the sheer size and openness of the vast upper deck. Some of this feeling is perhaps due to her having no built-up gunnels around the deck, as was the style for this period. Instead, Brunel opted for metal guardrails. Across the centre of the ship is a rudimentary conning bridge used when navigating in and out of harbour. This must have brought with it its own problems as passing orders to the wheel could not have been easy with the wheel situated around 100 feet away at the stern. The interior of the ship was divided into three decks the upper two of which were used for passenger accommodation and the lower for cargo. In the after section of the ship, the upper passenger deck contained the principal first class saloon. 110 feet long by 48 feet wide, it ran from just aft of the engine rooms to the stern. On each side of the saloon were corridors leading to 22 individual passenger berths arranged two deep, making a total of 44 berths for the saloon as a whole. First class they may be, but none could be described as opulent or even spacious. iron staircases at both ends of the saloon ran to the main deck above and the dining saloon below. Beneath the after saloon was the main or dining saloon, 98 feet long by 30 feet wide and fitted with dining tables and chairs capable of accommodating up to 360 people at one sitting. On each side of the saloon Seven corridors opened into four berths each for a total number of berths per side of 28 or 56 altogether. The forward end of the saloon was connected to a steward's galley 
while the opposite end contained several tiers of sofas. This saloon was apparently the ship's most impressive. Columns of white marble and gold, 24 in number, with ornamental capitals of great beauty, were arranged down its length and along the walls. The archways of the doors were tastefully carved and gilded, and surmounted with medallion heads. Mirrors around the walls added an illusion of spaciousness. By comparison, the steerage and crew's quarters were austere, damp, overcrowded and dark. No saloons to eat in here. They had to make do with tables outside the cabins and mess decks. Central to everything on board is the galley. It's amazing to think that up to 900 people were fed three times a day from this small kitchen. An entry from a first-class passenger's diary in 1852 recalls an impressive Victorian menu. Dinner, which was first rate, quite such as you would get at the best hotels. Soup, grouse, pigeon and veal pies, pork, ham and other meat dishes, sundry puddings and tarts and jellies, blancmange, cheese, celery and after all a dessert. At the heart of the great ship, installed amidships and with a combined weight of 340 tons, were the two giant propeller engines built to a modified patent of Brunel's father, Mark. The engines which rose from the keel through the three lower decks to a height just below the main deck were of the direct acting type, with twin 88-inch bore, six-foot stroke cylinders inclined upwards at a 60-degree angle capable of developing a total of 1,000 horsepower at 18 RPM. Steam power was provided by three 34 feet long by 22 feet high by 10 foot wide 5 PSI square salt water boilers located forward of the engines with eight furnaces each four at each end. 